You are welcome to type your questions or comments in the chat box and we'll go through them at the end of the program. I'll also be putting several links in the chat box throughout the program so you can find more information about this topic as we go. Before our speakers begin, I have a short anonymous poll that will take about one minute. It's just four questions. Your, democratic, your demographic information helps us ensure that our programs reach diverse audiences as required by our federal funders and supporters. So here is the poll. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure why, but our poll's not working. So I wanna tell you uh, why we're bringing you this program today. Since 1995, Northwest Regional Planning Commission in Spooner has received grant funding to host clean sweeps and to collect hazardous materials from households, farms, and businesses in nine northern Wisconsin counties. Ashland County has participated every year for the past 27 years. That means county board members have voted every year to use county funds to help pay for the collections. Thousands of participants from every town in the county have safely disposed of tens of thousands of pounds of material. This keeps them out of landfills, waterways, and out of the ground. You are part of the multi-part process of keeping our communities safer and cleaner. In fact, there's so much interest in this topic that I get more calls in the Ashland County Extension Office about hazardous materials than any other topic. So this year, I wanted to bring specialists who can talk about two other parts of the process of disposing of waste. We'll talk about the beginning of the process where we can reduce our use of hazardous materials in the first place to reduce the need for clean sweeps. And then we'll also talk about the last part of the disposal process, which is what happens to the items that I do have to take to a collection. I'm lucky I've got three great speakers to answer those questions. Our first speaker is Ray, Renee Bashel from the Wisconsin DNR. We'll talk about how to identify and choose safer non-hazardous products. And then we'll hear from two specialists from Veolia Environmental Services of North America, who will describe what happens to the materials that you bring to Clean Sweeps. So Renee Bashel is the Environmental Assistance Coordinator of the Small Business Environmental Assistance Program at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Renee's expertise is in helping businesses identify product ingredients that can be hazardous to your health and helps businesses find safer options. She can also help us identify toxic ingredients in household products by learning how to read labels. So welcome to Renee Bashel. All right, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> so I've spent most of my career helping people understand environmental rules. And over the years that I've been doing this, the number of chemicals in use has steadily increased. Uh, there are so many that it's hard for anyone to keep track of without and without testing, it's not clear whether the new ones are any better or worse than the old ones. But that's why this is a great opportunity to talk about finding cleaner and safer products for use in homes and even businesses. There are groups that have been studying products to ensure there are safer options, and then they've labeled them or provided other ways uh, for you to identify that something is uh, cleaner to use at your home or business uh, versus something else that might be on the shelf. Um, it's really important to know that not everything that we use can be simply tossed in the regular trash. Um, <clears throat> so if you'd rather not have to uh, take your leftover materials to special collection sites, there's ways to find alternatives. So I'm going to talk about certain products, why they're not safe uh, necessarily or not as safe as they could be. Um, and ways to look for uh, what's in those products that you should um, be uh, avoiding if possible. And, um, and then I'm going to share some examples of labels, as Lissa said, 
And then I'm gonna go through a number of resources that can help you find better products. You know, we've all seen the ads about uh, keeping laundry detergent pods away from kids. You know, those that's kind of an obvious product. We know while generally safe to use, it might have safety issues if it's used in the wrong way. And there's plenty of items like that out there uh, that you might assume just because they're on the shelf that they're safe to use. But once you read those labels, you can figure out that certain things are considered hazardous. Um, in a business setting, these kinds of materials are going to have strict requirements for safe handling during employee use, as well as when the material is disposed. Um, and in some cases, those small businesses can use the, the household hazardous waste sites. Um, <clears throat> so what are some of the criteria that make something hazardous? If the material could uh, is flammable, if it's uh, corrosive, like battery acid, where it can eat away at other materials, if it might react with another compound and together they create some kind of toxic gas, or if the compound itself is toxic. You know, we've heard the uh, news stories about lead pipes uh, where lead leaches into the drinking water and causes health issues. So there's other materials like that that you might find on the shelf. Um, <clears throat> It is helpful when there are state or federal rules that require manufacturers of the materials to use less hazardous contents. That way, um, the really bad stuff isn't on the shelves in the first place. Um, EPA does have set national standards to reduce volatile organic compounds and hazardous air pollutants in some consumer products. And there are other states that set their own standards as well. Um, some states have also created green chemistry programs to study reformulation of products. So there are a number of places where information is, is more available about those um, safer products. Um, and things like uh, bug spray, antibacterial spray, mold and mildew spray, those kind of cleaners, they have to prove to EPA that they eliminate the, the pests or the uh, items that they claim to and at the efficiency rate that they're claiming. EPA then registers those products and that registration number and label have to go on the uh, product that's being sold. Uh, but there are products that allow you to avoid those more ha hazardous constituents. Uh, and, and help you find uh, better pesticide products and also how to avoid the illegal ones. And even drugs and personal care products contain, can contain chemicals that could qualify as hazardous when disposed. Um, the, one of the things that most people might not be aware of is, is that nicotine itself is considered an acute uh, toxic material. And so small quantities were required to be handled as hazardous waste. There are now special rules for pharmacies uh, if they've got large quantities of materials, say, that are expired that they need to uh, dispose of, um, there are ways to do that safely. But for a household, if you've got some left over, uh, it's best to take that to a drug drop-off site um, <laughs> rather than throwing them in the trash. Um, and there's other, there's other products that you think about, personal products that are in, say, aerosol cans. If you haven't completely emptied the can, and it, that can could explode. So you don't really wanna put that into your trash. Um, but if it is empty, it can be recycled. So uh, as long as you can get it emptied, recycle that product, but uh, otherwise that can be a hazardous, potentially explosive product if you've got uh, material left in a propellant can. Um, some other uh, components in personal care products, if it's got a VOC or a hazardous air pollutant, um, it can also be harmful if you dump it down the drain. So if you've got leftover materials, just make sure and take a look at the labels and, uh, and potentially get them ready to go to a clean sweep site. Um, some uh, labels that I found as I was getting ready for this presentation, it was a good reminder that I've got a fair number of products in house that uh, I should be taking to my local clean sweep. Um, so terms that you want to look for for a flammable product are going to be names of different hydrocarbons, things like acetone and xylene. Um, it might just say that the vapor is harmful, or it might have um, a, a label that says maximum VOC on it. And uh, 
any anything with a, a VOC content in it is something that definitely could be flammable um, and or might meet some of the other hazardous components uh, definitions. Um, you know, this WD-40 is kind of ubiquitous. I think we all have that in our houses to help us loosen bolts and other metal that might be stuck. Um, but you can see right off the top, it's got danger on the top of the label. And then it says flammable. And there's breathing hazards. Uh, petroleum distillates is another VOC term. Um, all sorts of uh, terms that are good examples of what to avoid. But some situations do call for this type of product. And then if you use it all up in the proper way, you can recycle that can. Um, but if not, send it off to clean sweep if it's uh, still partly full. Um, some other flammable labels, you could see a few other uh, terms in there. Um, again, petroleum distillates, isobutane. Um, we might just say avoid eye, eye contact or you're gonna see some long chemical names after the term's warning. Um, corrosive or toxic labels are another thing to keep an eye out uh, for. This corrosive contains sodium hydroxide is an oven cleaner that um, you might find in your cabinets. Um, something that says immediately followed by important first aid um, directions can be something that you'd want to avoid. Uh, another product might have uh, the poison control number on the back. And that's kind of a, a good clue that you want to uh, avoid that if you can. But even uh, things that uh, might just kill mold and mildew in the bathroom or the kitchen, that can hurt skin and eyes and so on. Um, one of them even li lists personal protection equipment requirements if you're using it in lar larger spaces. So um, that's also something to take a look at. Um, the one uh, picture label on the bottom left corner here, you can see it says CAS number, and then it has these different digits, series of digits. And these are chemical abstract numbers for those long chemical names at the top of that label. So you can do a search on the internet for those CAS numbers, and you can find information about what the actual hazards are for those particular compounds. So as I was looking for resources to help folks find better chemicals, uh, uh, I found this interesting scale that's put out by Washington State with some a nice labeling for uh, uh, code words to uh, look at what to avoid. I mean, the obvious ones to avoid would say poison or danger. Um, but then, you know, caution or warning, there might be reasons to, to have that around and you just need to be safe while you're using it. Um, something safer is if it doesn't have any of those warning words like caution, danger, poison. Um, and then the safest are gonna be products that have actually earned these cleaner labels. Um, and I'm gonna show you a few more of those, but you can see right on this one in the green box, the safer choice label from EPA and there's a cradle to cradle certified label is another option. Um, but let's look at a couple of these. Um, EPA has a couple different uh, resources available. They have a safer choice uh, page, which I just mentioned, that's a specific label certification for products. And then they have a broader uh, sustainable marketplace with greener products and services. Um, and the, the sustainable marketplace has got a collection of different agencies and organizations with environmentally preferable labels. There are specific products. If you go to that webpage, uh, there's a consumer section, but there's also a section for purchasing agents and manufacturers. Um, the consumer section alone has categories of products that include 40 credible and effective private sector standards, eco labels, and certifications. Any one of these can be good resources for homeowners and business owners looking for safer, uh, sustainable products. Uh, the Safer Choice page has a searchable database that um, lets you look for a specific product or a specific use or product type. And I'm going to try and go to that web page. I think it should show up on your screen here. 
And we can try a little search. The, the slide that I'd shown was searching for a oven cleaner, just as a simple one, but you can specify whether it's a home use, and then it gives you a whole list of possible cleaning products or other products that you might want to um, find better uh, options for. So if we wanna go and look for a floor cleaner that's for home use, we click those items and then the database refines itself to a shorter list and shows you the product name, the company, um, and then you can link to those products. There are also options here because some people are um, sensitized to fragrances. You can actually click show only fragrance free products and that'll refine the list even more for you. So this is definitely a label to look for on the consumer products if you are looking for um, all these oh, items. Uh, on the sustainable marketplace, uh, there's a whole other range of logos that you might look for. Um, the Green Seal Certified is found on a number of products. Some of these other uh, labels are more for home, uh, home products like carpeting or paints or, or other materials like that. This uh, one here that doesn't give you an agency um, with, uh, it's actually the US Department of Ag uh, Bio Preferred uh, label. And I'll, I'll show you some links for those as well. So USD has a couple of different uh, options. They have their Bio Preferred products. They have organic products. Um, California has its own, as I mentioned, some states set their own standards. They have a safer consumer products list. Um, Green Seal and Earth 911 are a couple other resources to look into uh, that can give you lists of, of products. Another one that might be interesting for some to look into is the Retail Association offers guidelines for stores in terms of if they want to buy more sustainable products for themselves for their customers. But that could also be um, a useful resource for you to look at what is out there for those retail stores. Uh, and uh, in, in case any of the um, different ways of, of feeling the impact of the more toxic uh, products, if you're interested in learning more about those, um, EPA has put together some resources for consumers about the different impacts. And, and so if, if you um, take a look at this information later, um, there's also a wide, wide range of resources for homemade cleaning products that work just as well. And that allows you to avoid buying the more harmful products. I have included a few links here that looked like good resources. Um, I've even tried a couple of the recipes that they have there for the all natural cleaning um, materials. Um, some of them look pretty interesting, but one of the ways that can be very helpful if you've got a special situation is just searching the internet for what is the surface that you're trying to clean or the material um, that you're trying to clean? Is it wood or marble? Because those really have special needs to protect them. Or you're looking at certain fabrics. Um, there's a lot of resources out there for the home, uh, home households. Um, but another resource available for businesses is the Toxics Use Reduction Institute's searchable database. Their uh, information is available at cleanersolutions.org. And this is a resource from the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. They've been testing products for 25 years to see which ones are safer and produce the same outcome in terms of clean, a cleaned product that um, can go forward in the manufacturing process or out the door as a saleable product. Um, they've provided the test results in this database so as long as you know what it is that you are that you need to clean the substrate or the material and uh, the equipment that's being used to clean it, um, that, can, um, that you can look for it there. Um, I was gonna just give you a quick demo of that as well because it's not obvious. Um, 
So if you get to their database page, you wanna click on replace a solvent or find a product. Either one of those would give you a searchable opportunity. So you might look at, if you're using a certain solvent that you wanna get rid of, it has a very long list of possible solvents that might be used to clean. Um, we could pick something simple like an alcohol that you wanna replace. And then you can pick the contaminant. Maybe you've got an adhesive stuck on something, uh, material that you need to remove. Um, and you can, any kind of equipment just means how are you gonna apply that cleaning material? Are you just using uh, rags or wipes or are you spraying it? Are you soaking the material? There's a long line of options there. And then you want to check off whether it's only effective results or currently available results. Um, so just looking at only effective results, we did not get any results from that. But you know that's an opportunity to change things and see what other options might be out there. And then if you don't get results for your situation, you can re request a test. But as I mentioned, this is a business option. Um, so that's something to take a look at if you're a smaller business and you need to um, find some alternatives. If instead of disposing of chemicals or other materials, there might be a way to um, reuse a material. Uh, we do have an opportunity through the University of Wisconsin Green Bay in their Solid and Hazardous Waste Education Center. They have the Recycling Markets Directory. So you can search on um, particular items that um, you have that you would like to dispose of that you think might still be a usable product for someone else. This takes a, just a second here to load up the lists, but then you can search by what is this material that you have that someone else could use. Maybe you have waste plastics that someone else might um, have, and you would have a particular type of plastic. So right now, filtering that out, there are quite a number of resources that um, might be able to take those materials. But as listings change over time, you always wanna confirm by contacting those locations. And if you think you have something that you could add to the list, then you fill out the directory submission, filling out information about your business and then the materials that you might have available that someone else could use. So those are the main resources that I wanted to share, but I also just wanted to let folks know that there are resources at DNR to help you understand more about your hazardous waste management practices and any other environmental regulations that might apply to a business. Um, we have our sustainability and business support section and the section that I am a part of, we offer, um, a lot of resources. We have a number of industry specific pages. We have trainings and webinars posted online. We have spreadsheets to help you calculate different air pollutions and uh, other uh, emissions, uh, hazardous emissions that you might have. Um, and we're always available to help by phone um, and uh, our resources are available 24 seven. So check out the website or um, call our helpline and we will get back to you. And that's what I have for you. So I will stop sharing. Well, thank you so much, Renee. That is really, really informative. And I'm amazed to, to learn that there are so many different um, product labeling systems out there, which can really help us as busy consumers try to find some safe options. Um, one that I had found in my work that I use quite often is called the Environmental Working Group. And that is a not-for-profit organization that's been around for about 30 years. 
I often look on that website to check if a product is really safe or not, because as you showed us, sometimes the labels can be really complicated and they might have words such as natural or environmentally friendly, but those words don't really tell you what's in the product. So I use um, the work of environmental working group scientists who have been testing these products over and over to find out um, what's actually in them so that we can make smart and healthy decisions. So I'm just gonna put um, that information in the chat in addition to um, all the good resources that you had for us, Renee, uh, for folks to look at later um, after the end of this program. And I do wanna mention, not everyone aware of it is aware of this on Zoom, but if you go down, open your chat box and you go down to the very bottom uh, corner of chat where it looks like um, a new chat is open, you'll see three uh, dots in a horizontal line. And if you click on those three dots, it'll say save chat. And all you have to do is click the word save chat and all of the resources that we've put in the chat box will be available for you. I'm also going to send a follow-up email after this program that has the chat links in, as well as contact information for the speakers if you wanna get in touch with them after the program. So our next two speakers work with Veolia Environmental Services of North America. And Veolia is a private company that has been working for over 40 years with municipalities, states, and large corporations to sponsor clean sweeps and other waste management events. Northwest Regional Planning Commission in Spooner has contracted with Veolia to process the materials from all nine counties clean sweeps since 2020. Our our speakers include Josh Harmelick, who is the Veolia account manager. His role is to manage current business contracts as well as gain new businesses to start up even more clean sweeps events across America. And we'll also hear from Pat Baskfield. He's the operations manager and he's responsible for organizing all of our clean sweeps events. He oversees the field technicians who collect, pack, and ship the chemicals according to Department of Transportation and Environmental Protection Agency's regulations. So I'm really happy to have both of you here. Welcome, Josh and Pat. Uh, th thank you, Lisa. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, get my screen shared here. Just give me a second. Start the uh, slideshow. Um, there we go. Okay, as 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 Lisa mentioned, um, we uh, we're with Veolia Environmental Services, and we provide um, hazardous waste disposal services to to. Um, all industries, institutions um, throughout um, throughout the country, and um, what we're going to focus on here is is uh, our uh, household hazardous waste collection events. And uh, just as a kind of a little, um, I suppose, selling point for our company, we we're we're the largest in the uh, in the state. We do the most in the state of Wisconsin. Um, we manage uh, through the state of Wisconsin contract. We're, we're uh, every weekend we're providing a uh, a uh, program to a county um, uh, throughout the state. Um, the only weekends that we we work from well the beginning of April through mid November, and the only weekends that we do not have any where we're working are Memorial Day weekend, the Fourth of July weekend, and uh, Labor Day weekend. So we're, we're, we're extremely busy doing these uh, one day programs. In addition, um, we do uh, manage the uh, uh, some permanent facilities throughout the southeastern Wisconsin, primarily the uh, Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District uh, for the for primarily Milwaukee County. We also handle uh, Waukesha County and uh, we just started last year with uh, with Winnebago County, so so we are uh, um, advancing a little bit more into our, our permanent collection facilities. 
Um, and, and Josh, jump in if you got anything to add to anything there. And if not, I'll, I'll move to the next slide. Sure, and this kind of fits in here um, with what Renee was talking about. You know, we all have these items in our cabinets and in our um, in our garages, you know, and if you don't know what to do with them and you don't feel comfortable throwing the material away, that's when you'd bring it to the local household hazardous waste collection. So that's where we come in. So anything you don't want to put in the garbage or don't feel comfortable putting down the drain, bring the material to us. Yep, yeah. and um, so... The types of, of, of what we would call waste generators that, that we do service are um, obviously are the households, but also um, we through the DADCAP or State of Wisconsin DADCAP group, um, we also include uh, farm and uh, agricultural operations. And, and we also uh, service what we would call very quantity, very small quantity generators, um, which, which are primarily businesses, well, which are businesses. Um, but they only they only produce up to uh, 200 um, 200 uh, pounds per month of of waste. So that their uh, um, the hazardous waste regulations for that group of of generators is relatively relaxed, which allows them to to bring that material into these types of programs. Um, I'll go to the next slide. Um, from the, the different types of, of waste that that, uh, that we collect at these programs. And, and Renee did a great job of, of primarily explaining a lot of them um, in her, uh, in her uh, presentation is, um, is solvent and oil-based paints is probably our biggest one that we collect. And um, um, those materials could include uh, turpentines, um, um, any type of uh, oil-based paint that's flammable, um, get gasoline cans. We 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 take in. We got a lot of, of of folks that bring in their their old gasoline, and uh, we actually dump the gasoline out and give them the can back. Um, um, so any anything that would have a, a burn value to it is what we would uh, take in this category. Um, the the next biggest. That, that we do receive is, is uh, what we'd call pesticides, poisons, and dioxin formers. And the dioxin formers are, are a relatively small part of this waste stream, but they're, it's important. It's, it's uh, the old, um, they're, they're primarily weed killers and it would be, a, it's called 4,5-T, um, trioxy, phenoxy uh, chloride, which is, which is similar to Agent Orange and, um, um, it's it's a it's a highly toxic poison, and and we do manage that separately from others. Um, uh, the pesticides and poisons, um, herbicides, primarily we package those together and send those out. And and as Renee mentioned, most of these are registered uh, with the EPA um, as uh, as for for their uses. Um, another the next category. Um, that we receive in, in large quantity is what we is caustics and acids. Uh, a lot of these in the in your household are going to be uh, primarily drain cleaners. Um, um, Draino is both a uh, uh, sodium hydroxide, which would be a caustic, and also has uh, uh, there's there's some uh, formulations they make that are are also sulfuric acid, which they would use as a, it's a stronger drain cleaner, which uh, to, to, to clean the hair out. Um, also, in addition to that, you have your battery acids. Um, Josh, I'm kind of drawing a little blank on a few here. Um, we have a hydrofluoric acid that's used as a, as, a, um, as a metal cleaner. And anything else you can think of? Yep, your um, oxalic acid, your acetic acid. Anytime we see the word corrosive on the back of a of a container, then we know it's uh, kind of some nasty things. As Rene mentioned, that's um, can burn your skin and and just not good to to handle directly without the proper gloves or uh, personal protective equipment. Yep. Okay. And then. Um... Thanks, Josh. And then uh, the next category, which which probably is our third largest, is aerosol uh, cans. Um, we also um, at some um, programs we take in uh, propane cylinders, um, 
and uh, some free on cylinders, but that's that's up to the county. They're a little expensive, and some counties do not uh, take that in. Uh, but but the aerosol cans are you know pretty self-explanatory. Um, anything that's a uh, pressured container um, where, where it would spray out, and um, you can get a wide variety of different uh, products that could be in those aerosol cans. Uh, waste oil. Um, some counties uh, do want to take them. Um, would prefer to take those in. Some don't. Some have their own recycling facility for the oil, um, but we do take that in um, um, if the county does not have anything. Um, uh, reactive chemicals. Um, these could be your different pool chemicals, um, road flares, um, anything that 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 could um, react in in unsafe conditions and 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 become um, uh, either either generate heat and cause a fire or uh, or could release uh, toxic chemicals and in, in different uh, circumstances. Um, the next is any mercury type items, um, full thermostats, thermometers, barometers. Um, there's also um, thimerosal is also another uh, type of uh, um, is another mercury contaminated um, old medicine item that, that I don't know if you remember when we used to put that on our skin uh, back when you had a cut. That's I'm dating myself a little bit here, but uh, but that's a possibility. So so anything that mercury will take. Um, we also take in uh, fluorescent tubes, mercury containing lamps um, that we uh, that will package and send out. Um, some some programs uh, will take will take electronic equipment and um, um, and then also included uh, light ballast would be included in that. We have another a separate division from ours that 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 handles um, uh, the electronic equipment. Uh, sometimes they'll come out and help it, or work. Sometimes we'll take it in and pack it in. It it just depends on the county and what their wishes are. Um, a, a big item that we take in are, are batteries, whether they're lithium, ion, um, NICAD batteries, um, um, mercury contam co containing batteries. Those are getting smaller and smaller as a waste stream for us, however. Um, but generally, any battery that's, uh, um, that's recyclable would be, would, would be uh, not recyclable, but uh, uh, rechargeable uh, could be. Uh, um, considered hazardous with lithium or the or the NICADs, et cetera. Alkaline batteries, we do take those in, um, but you can uh, we also um, you can you can also throw those in the uh, in in the garbage. Um, um, they're relatively uh, safe for for um, for landfill. Another another um, big big waste stream that that some counties um, take in, most do not, is uh, latex paint. Um, when we do collect this, this is probably, Josh, I'm guessing 60% of what we take in on when we accept these. Um, uh, but that's a, it's a water-based paint, uh, relatively uh, non-hazardous, non um, but uh, most landfills won't take it unless it's solidified. So um, anything else in there, Josh, to add? No, and, and again, just to kind of follow up on my comment before, again, if there's any question, feel free to call Veolia, any of the offices, or um, just bring it into the local event. If, again, if you have any questions, you don't feel comfortable throwing it away or, or putting bring it into us. And, and Pat's right, the latex paint, typically we tell people to solidify the material with uh, cat litter, um, oil dry, sawdust, or just let it dry out and then the uh, landfills will take it once the material is dried out. Okay, thanks, Josh. Um, disposal methods. Um, Lisa, Lisa asked, mentioned she gets a lots of questions on what happens to this stuff after we collect it, obviously. We're collecting a lot of different materials, and and um, nobody knows where it goes after we take it in. So for for a lot of the uh, um, solvents and paints and aerosol cans and waste oil that we bring in, we we send it to what's called a, a fuels blending uh, facility, which which is capable of taking uh, 
taking in th those high BTU type um, products and, and bulking it up into tanks and they actually blend it into what's called a usable fuel that many cement kilns and um, asphalt, I believe asphalt plants use it in their, um, in their heating processes uh, for when they're, when they're manufacturing the, the different products. And um, um, those facilities are obviously permitted in order to, to accept that material, but it, but it is a form of, uh, of recycling for this material rather than using a, 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 a fresh fuel, um, they, they, they'll, they'll use a waste fuel um, that, they can, that they can burn their 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 um, their particular burning or their boilers or what or their ovens that they use um, don't require a high quality fuel and are able to use this. Um, we also um, we also send a lot of material to uh, our uh, what's considered a hazardous waste incinerator. Um, generally, the the temperature on these units are um, are in the twenty two hundred to 2,500 degree Fahrenheit range, which would um, uh, pretty much destroy the bonds of most of the chemical products and break them down into their into uh, carbon dioxide and, and uh, water um, and, and carbon um, when they break it apart. Um, and they do have uh, 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 highly advanced uh, scrubber units on the back end um, which they regulate the uh, oxygen level, the carbon monoxide levels, um, NOx levels, and the and the pH uh, levels of the uh, gases coming out to make sure that it, that they're that it, everything's safe. But for the most part, um, because of the recycling value, um, the pesticides and poisons and dioxin formers. Um, are, are, and reactive chemicals in our PCB light ballast that we receive. Um, and these are the older light ballasts um, uh, are sent for incineration. Uh, a couple of the, uh, I mentioned we, we do a couple of the uh, uh, permanent facilities um, as a recycle reuse program. Um, they have a, uh, a re reuse chemical reuse area where we actually take in the material and then set with the different products that look relatively new or, or, or have a large volume left in the container. Uh, we'll set those out and actually um, for people to reuse. And a couple of the counties are, were real successful where we're probably put out 30 to 40% of that material and somebody will actually come in while we're there during the program. And, and take that material out and, and reuse it. Uh, mainly, it, it, you see that the pesticides or any unused oil containers, uh, that, that sort of thing, um, um, it is, is highly popular when, when doing in that. Solvents is another one. You, you know, a lot of people will get some people that bring in full containers of turpentine um, that they didn't use, and, and somebody else obviously has a use for that. Um, from uh, 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 from caustics and acids, um, we we if if it's a if we get a larger quantity in, we'll send that off for for a treatment where it's the 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 material is neutralized, and uh, turn it to water and salt, and then dispose of that way. If it's in smaller containers, we actually we also send those for incineration. Um, for for recycling. Um, our facility, uh, both from the mercury and mercury containing lamps, um, um, we have a recycling facility that, that manages those two items. Uh, the, mer the mercury containing lamps are actually sent through a, uh, a lamp, well, it's called a lamp processing machine, but what it does, it actually crushes the lamps and contains the, when a, when a fluorescent lamp uh, expires, essentially all the mercury, what happens in, and what makes it expire is the mercury is actually absorbed into the phosphorus powder that, that's along the outside of the, um, of the lamp. And, and once that mercury is absorbed into there, the, the conductivity of the mercury inside the lamp is very weak and that's where you start getting the waves in the, in the lamp. And, um, and then that, that 
um, so that material is crushed and we actually separate the powder, the phosphorus powder from the glass. And, um, and, and that material is heated up and the mercury is actually extra extracted from the phosphorus powder in a distillation process. And, and, and then elemental mercury is recovered on the back end of that. Um, same with the uh, thermometers and, and um, all the other mercury containing, elemental mercury containing equipment. Um, is, is, is also heated up and the, the mercury is then um, um, vaporized and, and then cooled down and back into its liquid form. And, and, and that's also sent out for, um, for recycling and, or for, for product redistribution. Um, there, there's still, while mercury is being phased out in a lot of um, Different products right now. There's it's still it's still relatively it's a unique chemical that in some products they, they still need to keep using it. So there still is a, a large market for mercury on the back end. Um, so we we are able to sell some that we haven't. But um, 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 and then there's a, the U.S. government has a program for mercury that that. Uh, um, any, any leftover or any excess mercury that's unable to be sold is sent to a uh, storage facility for perpetual storage, which is, uh, I believe it's in Texas and uh, it's run by the, uh, it's run by a private company, but funded by the, by the uh, EPA. Um, all batteries are sent for recycling, um, whether they're the uh, NICADs um, or, or lithium batteries. Um, um, both the nickel and the cadmium are recovered and reused. And same with the lithium, there's a couple companies out there that are able to do that. Um, latex paint is probably more landfill, uh, but there are some communities out there that, that'll take, take the cans of latex paint and bulk them up into, and pour out the liquid paint into a 55 gallon drum and then use that latex paint for, uh, for painting over graffiti. Um, it's mainly in the larger cities. I don't believe there's anyone in Wisconsin doing that. Um, but I know that there's throughout the United States that it, it, uh, there are a few few programs in the larger cities where they're doing that. Um, it forms kind of a, 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 a bluish gray. When you when you mix them all together, it ends up being a bluish gray color, uh, which they use to to uh, to paint over. Zach, anything that, I mean, uh, Josh, anything that I missed? Sure, Pat, great job. Uh, just to, as a whole here, you know, Veolia is trying to do, we want to, you know, reuse, first of all, like Pat was saying, some of these communities have those reuse programs, which is wonderful. If someone can save some money by buying a deck stain um, or by getting a deck stain instead of buying it, wonderful. We always want to do the, the best thing, which is recycle, first of all, right? We want to re reuse if we can, then we recycle it. And kind of worst case, we want to incinerate it. You know, if there's a way to recycle it, kind of put it back to use, wonderful. So I would say over 50% of the items we take in get recycled. Maybe it's a higher number than that even. So, you know, we just want to make sure we're, we're doing the, the best things possible here at Violia with the waste that comes in. Okay. All right, and then just kind of uh, probably one of the other questions is how are these things funded? Um, as uh, Lisa mentioned, um, um, the majority of them are, are, are primarily county funded. Um, um, here here the, uh, in Milwaukee, it's not so much uh, that it's the uh, community or the county that's funding it, it's actually the, uh, the sewage district, which they're providing a service to keep and and from their standpoint, it's it's because they're um yeah the they're the, the sewage or or the stormwater and the uh, and the sewage from here goes through and back on the Lake Michigan. They want to try to eliminate any potential contamination as possible. So they they strongly um they're they're very strong in making sure that this program succeeds. And pulling that and pulling those items out of their waste streams um, uh, moving forward. Uh, the, the state of Wisconsin also through DADCAP um, has uh, uh, offers grant monies for um, um, for for both agricultural and households uh, programs. And then and then also um, uh, for 
because of the because of the uh, centralized uh, program for a HHW program, we're also um, the part this very small quantity generators um, do pay for that, but it's at such a reduced rate because we're already there doing the the, the county program that the uh, the small client generators can bring it to us, uh, thus eliminating our mobilization fees and 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 a lot of labor fees that a, a larger quantity generator larger quantity generator would absorb um, if that was uh, if that was part of that. So we're able to provide a, a, a highly substantial uh, reduced fee to these types of generators for them to bring it in, which is an incentive for them to use the, the, uh, the programs um, um, when we do the household hazardous waste. Josh, anything to add on that? Oh, no, Pat, I think you covered it. Thanks. Okay, great. And then um, this is the last thing. So any anybody got any questions? Uh, this is Lissa. Um, I have been getting questions since I started promoting this. Um, people have been emailing me. Um, we have a lot of people who had expressed interest in watching the recording. So um, I invite our participants to ask any questions, but also I did have several for um, both of our speakers. Um, for Veolia, um, we had someone who asked, what kind of education or experience do you think people who want to have a career in hazardous waste management should have? What kind of experiences or education should we have? And uh, do you train your own employees? I, Josh, I could, I could take this. Uh, um, what we look for is uh, uh, for, for, for these particular uh, jobs, we look for people that have uh, graduated from that have a four year degree in a, a science background. And uh, and we do we do uh, we bring them in on an entry level uh, basis, and we and we do train them extensively um, over over you know one to two years. And and for the most part, and um, most of the uh, both Josh and myself, it started as a uh, um, entry level employee. And um, and uh, learn you, you you do learn quite a bit um, um, of knowledge of the both the hazardous waste regulations, how to dispose of something, and and uh, the safety part of it. Um, where where you, you probably learn more doing this, learning the hazardous waste business in this line of work than you would um, in 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 most others. Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, we also have uh, quite a few part-timers that um, work these HHW events too. And, and again, we bring them in and, and work with them um, kind of on the job experience and kind of show them what we do. And again, the chemical compatibility, uh, what can go with what and kind of the, some of the rules and regulations. And certainly not something you can learn overnight, but we slowly train and bring people on. And we have all these events, let's just say there's eight to 10 people people from uh, at all levels, you know, people who are just starting and people who have been there like Pat and I for 15 plus years. Yeah, it's a fantastic career and we're never going to run out of hazardous waste. So it's good job yeah. security too, I imagine. Um, Renee, I had a business email me that wanted to verify that the services you offer at the Small Business Environmental Assistance Center are free. Is that correct? Yes, that's Correct. Yep. We uh, anything that we can help a company with um, is uh, we're paid internally by um, uh, different environmental fees that go through the different programs. And uh, if it's something that's more complicated that they need more help with, then they need to go outside of our our assistance um, and find someone like a consultant. But there are quite a number of things that we can do to help them. Nice. Then it looked like one of your slides that you could um, have some virtual assessments or also make a house call if necessary. Yeah, correct. We are happy to um, where we um, 
can get out to the facility. Sometimes that helps us better understand what they have going on in their operations and take a look at the equipment and, and figure out what uh, types of pollution they might be generating, whether it's air pollution or wastes. And uh, we can help them kind of sort through all of that. Sometimes it is easier in person than answering questions on the phone. Excellent. And I'm curious, um, what is the strangest thing that anyone's ever brought to a Clean Sweeps event? I can take my shot, Pat, maybe you have an idea too. Um, we've seen several um, elderly people bring in two liter bottles of elemental mercury that were sitting in their basement um, from who knows what from years ago uh, is always a special thing. Um, heavy 20 some pounds and some older individual has that. And you're like, oh, careful, careful, careful. Um, We've seen some uh, old military things come in over the years, um, which is somewhat alarming. You know, most of us are not trained in uh, reactive type um, of those military type agent things, um, but typically the police get involved with that. Um, it's interesting, but again, bring it to the right place, kind of. <laughs> sure. We're there to help them out. And then uh, Pat, any thoughts on your end? Yeah, the only, the one thing that comes to mind is uh, many, many years ago, uh, carbon tetrachloride was used as a fire suppressant and people would hang glass glass vials of it in their basement or in, in their attic. And and if, uh, if the fire, the glass would obviously melt and the carbon tetrachloride would fall down and put up the fire. So I, I've seen, I've seen quite a few of those over the years. Wow, that's amazing. I've never heard of that before. Well, we're at about the top of our hour here. I put two more things into the chat that could be helpful for people. First, the um, 2022 Clean Sweep schedule that's already started this year and runs through September. Those again are um, organized by Northwest Regional Planning Commission. So I've got the link to the schedule as well as what is and is not acceptable. And then Ashland County's Extension Office has been working on a guide to household hazardous waste so that people can take uh, different materials to different businesses in the Ashland area throughout the year. Things like batteries, light bulbs, um, appliances, that kind of thing. Um, it, the guide contains information on whether you can bring them there free or whether there's a fee and the hours and the phone numbers. So it's just a way that we try to keep people informed about how to safely dispose of hazardous materials throughout the year. And there's a link to that guide in the website. So this has been such an enlightening program. I know I have a lot more questions. I need to learn a lot more about labels and how to read them properly because I'm sure I have things under the kitchen sink that are hazardous or corrosive or dangerous. So I hope it's also helped you all get ready for the clean sweeps events in your counties this summer. And I wanna say thanks to our speakers, Renee Bachelle, Josh Ham Harmerlink and Pat Baskfield. I think we've learned a lot to help us reduce the toxic products in our households, farms, and businesses. So thanks for joining us. Be safe out there, and we hope to see you at a Clean Sweeps event.